or the famous Eiffel Tower in Paris. It had better be the Eiffel Tower. I didn't travel all the way to Paris to see an erector set. Taking a field trip to Gay Paris, the city of lights. It's a dirty job, but somebody has to do it. is located in the heart of France. If that's the heart, then the Seine River must be the aorta. And in the middle of the aorta, or Seine, is a small island called the Ile de la Cité. If it looks a little tired, it's because it's been around since 300 BC. The pioneer Parisians thought this would be a great place to start a city, since it was already there. Ile de la Cité is where you find Notre Dame Cathedral. Just look up, you can't miss it. That's right, it's the big old looking church right there. It's an excellent example of Gothic architecture, as any gargoyle will tell you. The French began building Notre Dame in 1163. It took them 182 years to complete it. When it was finished, the workers shouted, boy, are we old. Of course, they shouted it in French, since gargoyles are almost never bilingual. Notre Dame is the setting for Victor Hugo's famous book, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Hmm, that name rings a bell. In the novel, Notre Dame's bell tower was the home of Quasimodo the Hunchback. Guess they had quite a housing shortage back in Quasimodo's days. On the bright side, Quasimodo always knew what time it was. I have a hunch he was quite happy there. But back to our field trip. No, that's not Quasimodo. It's a gargoyle, the first clue to identifying Gothic architecture. The second clue that we're in Gothic land is flying buttresses. That's why the gargoyles look so unhappy. They're constantly ducking flying buttresses. Would you believe flying buttresses provide extra support for the walls? As for the funny name, just take away the buttresses and watch those walls fly. And if that isn't enough, Notre Dame has an inside too. Here's the ultimate proof that Gothic architecture is right above our heads. These beautiful rib vaults help support the roof. The vaults are like wires in an umbrella, and they hold up a very heavy church. There's the magnificent rose window of stained glass that allows streams of colored light to shine through. That's what stained glass windows do best. Trying to clean off those stains would be a real pain. Looks like we're headed the right way. As you can see, some of those statues are missing their heads. Would you believe that was an old French headache cure? Would you believe a sculptor who ran out of rock? 
This is the Gallery des Rois, where the 28 headless statues are kept. That means Gallery of the Kings. During the French Revolution, the people of France chopped off the statues' heads because the statues represented France's kings. Of course, without the heads, those rock bodies could belong to anyone. So we'll have to take your word for it. Time for the old inspector to do some ace detecting and solve the mystery of the missing royal heads. Wowzers! This is either the Royal Parisian Bowling Ball Works, or I cracked the case. The missing heads are all here at a national museum called the Musée de Cluny. I call it Cluny's Headworks. Actually, a construction worker cracked the case before I did. He accidentally stumbled across the heads at a building site where he was heard to exclaim, Heads, I win! The Musée de Cluny is a good home for the royal heads. They blend right in with the other old stuff. Would you believe these guys are fixing broken sculptures? Would you believe they're cleaning up after an office party? How about reconstructing Humpty Dumpty? The master puzzle maker of them all. Gustav Eiffel built this monument a hundred years ago. The Eiffel Tower is one of the most outstanding monuments of Paris. My uncle, Shifty Gadget, once sold the Eiffel Tower to a couple of tourists. Then he changed his residence to the Bastille. Mr. Eiffel built the tower in 1889 for the Universal Exposition or World's Fair. It made it easier to find your horse cart after the fair. Just look for Eiffel 11B and listen for that familiar whinny. They were going to take the tower down after the 20-year exposition was over, but it would have been a lot of work and by then the Parisians had come to love it. And of course, by then they needed it to find their car. When in Paris, do as the Parisians do and walk up the 1,652 steps which zigzag their way up to the top of the Eiffel Tower. Coincidentally, the same number of steps take you down the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower is repainted every seven years and it takes 45 tons of paint to cover the entire structure. Now that we know how hard the stairs are, let's take the elevator. But first, an Inspector Gadget field trip fact. When Eiffel built the tower in 1889, he wanted to make it twice as tall as any other building, and he did. It's twice as tall as the Washington Monument and twice as hard to climb. It's 984 feet tall. Here's a Parisian dog who didn't make it out of town for the summer. It's a dog's life. Sorry, no wet dogs allowed in the Eiffel elevator. This is more like it. That wet dog will never know what he missed. Well, then again, maybe he will. We made it! Top of the world, my gadget! The Eiffel Tower was the first radio tower in the world in 1915. It was also one of the first television transmitters in 1925. Now, if only they had television sets. If you look closely, you can see millions of rivets. Two and a half million, to be exact. I'm not going to count them. I'll just take their word for it. Without the rivets, you'd have five short towers lying around down there. The tower was made of five pre-made parts that were stacked up and fastened together with, you guessed it, lots of rivets, but no flying buttresses. And I can't find a gargoyle anywhere. Let's take a closer look at the incredible scenery of Paris. Look at those people down there. They look like Parisian ants. There's the Seine River, the Grand Arch, and the Louvre. If it wasn't for all those beautiful landmarks, 
you can really see Paris. Wowzers, this is a huge monument. Either that or the rest of the city has shrunk. It's the Arc de Triomphe. It took over 30 years to build and was completed in 1836 to honor the troops of Napoleon, one of the great leaders of France. It's 164 feet high and 148 feet wide. It's so big that one time a small plane attempted to fly through the arch. Missed it by that much. Let's just skip the gadget copter and drive around the arch. And around the arch. And around the arch. Twelve major avenues come together at the Arc de Triomphe. Some of them even lead. This is the world-renowned Brazilian ice cream parlor, or as the French say, Glace de Bertillon. Glace means ice cream, and that means delicious in any language. Go, go, Gadget Ice Cream Scooper! So many flavors and so little time. Ah, back on tour. The map says Bon Appetit and follow the ice cream dribbles in a straight line to... the outline of a building? Aha! A missing building and a sign. 200 years ago, this is where the infamous Bastille prison was located. It held dangerous criminals, political opponents of the king, and one very silly uncle of mine. Here's the original foundation. On July 14, 1789, freedom fighters who were against the king tore down the fortress. I guess they made their point because it started the French Revolution. Every year, the French celebrate July 14, which is known as Bastille Day. The French kick off their celebrating the night before with a ball organized by the local firemen. That way, they're early in case of a fire. Wowzers! That's a big firecracker! Oh, wait a minute. That's an old empty cannon at the Envali. Remember who was honored at the Arc de Triomphe? He's buried here, and his name was Napoleon. He was a little guy with big ambitions for France. And he makes a nifty dessert. Starting in 1796, Napoleon began his campaign to conquer Europe and almost succeeded, much like the plane that tried to fly through his arch. Napoleon later died in exile. The Anvalide used to be a soldier's barracks, but no one was using it in 1840, so they buried Napoleon here. Hope the soldiers found another barracks. Today, most of the buildings are occupied by the military services and the Army Museum. And since Napoleon doesn't take up much room, they park the cannons here, too. Probably makes them feel at home. This neighborhood is called La Défense, which is a futuristic place that has a collection of unusual and colorful apartment towers and office buildings. Looks like a flying buttress flew by too fast. One of the most famous buildings is the 35-story arch made of glass and marble. It's so big, you can fit the Notre Dame Cathedral inside it. But don't try it on a busy Sunday morning. This artist gave La Défense the thumbs up. That looks like fun. Go, go, gadget skates! Just a rollerblade away is one of the most famous art collections in the world. The Louvre Museum, which is actually inside the largest palace in the world. But before it was a palace, it was a fortress that couldn't stop growing. It was still growing as of 1993. Kind of like my Chia Pet. The glass pyramid was built by a famous American architect named I am Pei, an Egyptian building built by an American inside a French fortress. And they say we can't all get along. The Louvre has over one million works of art, and some of them are pretty good. 
we'll have to come back on another field trip to see more. I may even dash off a self-portrait for them, if I can find my crayons. Napoleon not only collected countries, he collected their art by the shipload. Napoleon missed collecting one great piece, it was already there. In the early 1500s, King Francois I bought a very famous painting by the Italian artist Leonardo da Vinci. It's called the Mona Lisa. She's the woman with the funny smile. Why do you think she's smiling? Probably just got back from the dentist. TGV stands for Très Grande Vitesse, which means very high speed. These trains are among the fastest in the world and can reach speeds up to 186 miles per hour. But as fast as they are, they still don't get you out of France. We're going to the village of Mont Saint-Michel, which is 230 miles northwest of Paris. It's probably even further from where you are. Wowzers! Mont Saint-Michel. That was faster than taking one of those fast trains. Here we are across the waters from Mont Saint-Michel. But you can't get there from here. According to this sign, it's too dangerous to walk, boat, or swim to the island because it's surrounded by quicksand and changing tides. Or is that quick tides and changing sands? Kind of explains the drop-off in the tourist trade. Hour by hour, the treacherous quicksand turns into a huge ocean. Then, before you can blink an eye, it's low tide and dry as a bone. This granite rock island is called Mont Saint-Michel. 1,000 years ago, a monastery was built for poor monks, obviously during the low tide. Later, the island turned into a prison. They didn't even have to change the furniture. Today, they've made Mont Saint-Michel into a national monument. It's much easier for tourists to get to the island nowadays. In fact, there's a taxi. Hope it's quicksand-proof. Reminds me of my Uncle Jack Gadget. He drove a taxi for years before they made him return it. Since 1802, there have been many attempts to build a tunnel under the English Channel. 193 years later, they finally succeeded. Up until then, the train had to take a boat. We're on the channel train under the English Channel. The English have only one channel, and it's not even a TV network. In 1986, ground was broken on either sides of the tunnel, and they figured as long as they broke it, they might as well keep digging, so they did until they met in 1994. The channel under the channel is really three not-so-tiny tunnels. Try to say that three times fast. Two one-way tunnels and one service tunnel to funnel fresh air for the faint of heart. Try to say that once. Let's see how the channel chopping was done. These machines are called boring machines, but there's nothing boring about them. They dig dirt big time. The train travels 195 miles per hour and gets you to either London or Paris in just three hours, as long as they remove the boring machine from the tracks. If you do it the old-fashioned way, by train or car and ferry, it takes between seven and eight hours. That's not counting the time it takes your stomach to forget the trip. At last, the Palace of Versailles. This is where French royalty partied in the late 1600s. Wowzers! Those guys knew how to live. It was built by King Louis XIV to glorify the richness and beauty of France. There are hundreds of sculptures all over the 6,000 acres. 
probably made it easier to find your carriage. There are over 1,400 fountains sprinkled throughout the estate or sprinkling throughout the estate. Unlike the Washington Monument, the Eiffel Tower is growing. It must be eating its veggies. Actually, it's because the tower is made of iron, which expands when it's hot. In the summer, the tower is seven inches taller than it is in the winter. I hope you had fun in Gay Paris, being awed by the Eiffel Tower, subdued by the Seine, amused at the museums, buttressed at Notre Dame, and challenged by the Channel Train. Until next time, go, go, Gadget Field Trip! <laughs>